Time flies, my hair grows, and more games are meant to be played, as they are and as they were. This is the fourth installment in Majority, and I got two more games down as well as a book. So let's just see what they are, right? Welcome to Majority. Okay, so I like to start these off by talking about what I've been reading. You know, just knock it out. So I read a play. It's called Waiting for Godot. And in this play, two characters, Vladimir and Estragon, are literally standing around waiting for Godot. And this play details everything that happens over a two-day span while they are waiting for this man. This is not really clearly defined who Godot is within the play, but a lot of what happens in the play is either tragical or comedic within the framework of their waiting. Now, this play was recommended to me. I can't remember why, but somebody else who likes to read had told me that this was worth reading. So I read it, and I felt a little bit unsatisfied by the end, like not much had occurred. Now, I've read these typical existential-style works before, and I do like the idea of existentialism, uh, not knowing what's out there, except knowing that you can only know that you don't know what's out there and this one I don't know I just didn't know by the end of it like what it was really trying to achieve other than saying that there are two characters who are kind of idle I think this is supposed to be somewhat of a period piece and capturing the lives of post-war civilians who aren't really sure what to do with themselves so some of that was lost on me, but all the same, I could see why the characters thought the way they did. This was your typical idiot couple, you know, like dummy, dummy friends whose quips back and forth are comedic in a sense. If you can think Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, maybe like your Tweedledee and your Tweedledum, so to say. And the way that they interact with like the three other characters in this play around them does prove somewhat comedic. So they're waiting for Godot throughout the entire play. And then by the end, they decide that he's not coming. And then they wait some more. The play leaves you hanging in some aspects, but it also has a lot of comedic relief. A lot of it's like, you know that joke about Who's on first? Oh, the man on second. But if the man on second made it first, who gets on second? Well, I don't know. What about third? I mean, who's going to win the game? It's sort of that type of logic between the dialogue. And it works in some aspects. And it, I found it fell short in others. But all the same, it's an interesting play. And it might be worth reading for that. One note I would like to make is that if you plan on reading a play, you should probably... Either read it alongside the audiobook so you can actually hear the dialogue or you should read it aloud with somebody. That's a good way to make the time go by. I read this one with my girlfriend on the train. So not entirely, but some of it. So that helped me get through it. I did play through two games this month. But first, let me just talk about games that I'm in the process of playing, have started, etc. And that I am enjoying. So I'm enjoying uh, Persona Q. I'm enjoying Yakuza 6. And also started Super Mario Brothers 3 on my World 6. So that should be done soon. I've also played two games this month. In addition to experiencing another, which we'll get to later. The first was Geometry Wars Galaxies. This is a classic 2D shooter. Now, I played Geometry Wars Galaxies on the PS4. I played that one to the credits. That was a lot of fun. It's a beautiful game and it's intense arcade action. I've always liked this one a little bit more though, primarily because of classic controller support. And also due to the fact that this is two dimensional and vector based graphics. It's so easy going on the eyes and it's really easy to get lost. And this is the type of game where you start it and you don't want to stop playing a level. And then you just keep going until you get those medals and then you keep saving up to purchase the next planet's worth of levels. And then you can upgrade all your weapons. This is a lot of fun. This game will not run you more than a couple bucks. You should definitely hunt it down. My issue with it has to be that one world's worth of levels are locked. 
unless you connect your DS and your copy of Geometry Wars on the DS with this game. That to me is, is pushing it, that's too much. Now, if the one on the DS happened to be like a standout game like this was, I might tell you, yeah, I would do that. But you know, I've watched um, my friend, Bossom Burf, who's reviewed both Galaxies and the one on the DS, and you know, he definitely pitched this game to me. He put this game on my radar, but the one on the DS, you know, I'm, that's, that's doing too much for me. But if you like arcade shooters and you like games on the Wii that have classic controller support, you absolutely need to get Geometry Wars Galaxies. Another game that I did play on the Wii, so this was month of the Wii, so, you know, the Wii rocked my month as the Wii will rock you. Haha, <laughs> I worked that one in. But I played, I told you before I was starting Mario Brothers 3, well, I'm actually playing it on the Wii. The way that I'm playing it is through the Mario, Super Mario All-Stars collection disc on the Wii. Now, a thing about that disc is that that game has all of the games except for Super Mario World, from what I understand, that are on the Super Mario All-Stars SNES cart. I might be mistaken. There might be more on that. But the games that are featured on there also have classic controller support. To me, I do not want to play the Wii unless I can play it with a classic controller. I do not want to have to aim anything at a sensor bar. To me, that is, it's just doing too much. I don't want to play a game so that like I have to set up and like sit a certain kind of way. No, having a wireless controller that's, or a wired controller plugged into a wireless controller is a lot, but it's it works because some of the games on the Wii are fantastic. And I played through Mario Bros. 1. It's the first time in my life I've ever played through the first Mario Brothers. And I have to say, you know, I was excited. I was really excited to play the first one. I've had the collection desk for a while since it went down to about $20. But, you know, Mario Bros. 1, not on the uh, Atari, Super Mario Bros. 1, is great. It's a great game. And, you know, I, I've obviously played it before. I've obviously played the sections. You know, you, you hop the the ceiling in world one two and then you can warp to world four you know that's that's a classic piece of knowledge that's passed down to kids like who's, who played the game from the 90s and the 80s but i've never played it to the end and holy cow does that game get hard in that last world i think i probably played that last world a good 20 to 25 times before i could beat it and that's not taking into account all the lives that i lost 8-1 is not so bad. 8-2 is pretty hard. 8-3 is also pretty hard because you have to really know the jumps. And that level of difficulty is not something that you really see from the 2D Mario games nowadays. You know, the one on the Nintendo DS, the new Super Mario Bros., that game is very casualized. You realize that once you play the one that was made for the NES. And the thing I love about the collection on the Wii is that it doesn't, take any turns to make it easier you know it it really preserves that level of difficulty and challenge with that being said the first game is stiff it feels very stiff i don't you know at first i thought it was the controller but i think it's actually the original game is just a little bit more archaic than some of the other ones it just hasn't aged that well that being said it is a must play one thing that is not a must play though is the game that I'm about to show you the review for and this one is dedicated to my friend Alex. So with that being said, enjoy the review.
God damn, you don't know what I had to do to hype myself up for this one. I can't even say it. This is a game, question mark, for the Nintendo DS, personal trainer cookie, that Alex, my friend from Table Zone, has sent me approximately a year ago. And when he had sent it, he had challenged me to play it and review it. And you know me, I'm really good at reviews, right? But I guess he thought that like maybe I, I don't know anything about cooking. Well, you know what, Alex? There you're wrong. Because I know that any master chef in the kitchen has his or her trusty bandana. So I went ahead and I bought myself a new one. And I'm going to... I'm going to gear up and get ready to play and review personal trainer cooking and see if I even need this, if this is something that's going to benefit my skills in the kitchen or not. And if I can even tie this right. All right, fire. So the way I'm going to do this is I've got my GoPro spent with work money that I'm going to be using to record while I play and then I'm also just going to be recording live thoughts so let's have at it shall we <laughs> alright here we have it personal trainer cooking so, you know we're really going for quality uh, quality camera work here and uh, also you know Dressed up for this. Cooking tips. Be careful when consuming raw meat, seafood, or eggs. Um, adults should supervise children in the kitchen. All right, we're off to a great start. I'm really having a lot of fun here. Personal trainer. Cooking. Hello. Let's get cooking. It has music. <laughs> okay, on the bottom screen there's things going on, uh, namely recipes, cooking A to Z, shopping list, settings, and there, it looks like there's a highlight of the day, Australian meat pie. How would you like to choose a recipe? Google. Um, by country, that sounds cool. Yeah, what's, what's a good USA dish? That's what I want to know. Potato salad? I don't, I'm not trying to spend 50 minutes on potato salad. New England clam chowder? No, nah, I'm going to save that for the restaurant. Jambalaya? That doesn't even sound American. Mac and cheese, classic. I'm going for the mac and cheese. Unpretentious and simple to make, but still immensely satisfying. Macaroni and cheese is a perennial American favorite. Generous amounts of cheddar are mixed into a white sauce and poured over boiled pasta. You know what I say? I say okay to mac and cheese. Alright, tips. Let's make sure this is still recording. When adding the milk to the cooking flour, stir the contents of the pan the whole time with the wooden spoon so that nothing sticks to the bottom of the pan. But where's the recipe? Oh, let's view the let's view the ingredients. That's probably important. All right, let's go get 10 ounces of macaroni, two tablespoons of butter. Oh, look at that! It has an illustration of every ingredient for you. How useful! In case I had no idea what butter was. Um, milk. This is whole cow's milk. Wow, that that particular brand looks looks pretty wholesome 10 ounce of cheddar cheese that doesn't look like any cheddar cheese I've ever seen that looks like a bar of soap salt black pepper all right so you got some uh, pretty simple stuff here macaroni butter flour milk cheddar cheese salt and pepper oh you can even see what utensils you're gonna need Oh, I don't know who does this. I don't do this. Come on. Any professional amateur cook like myself is going to tell you to skip all the extras. But, you know, this game wants you to go the extra mile. Make sure you do it to pitch perfect perfection. But let's just see what the steps are, shall we? 
oh look at that in case you didn't remember to click on utensils it tells you again what you need so preparation chopping up the cheddar step one chop finely well i'm a fine chopper if i do say so myself but let's get chopping step number two boil the macaroni then strain making the sauce melt the butter cook the flour add the milk remove from heat oh i'd never think to remove it from the heat i'd just burn the house down add the cheese stir well season to taste season what season is it talking we're in spring does it want me to spring right into it stir stir in the macaroni i would never have figured that one out without personal cooking trainer preparing to serve transfer to dishes it's ready all right let's cook all right let's get started i'm scared the first step is to prepare the cheddar cheese you'll need a cutting board and a kitchen knife what is this am i supposed to tell it you'll need a cutting board and a kitchen knife Cutting board and kitchen knife. Okay. Finally chop the cheddar. Chop cheddar. Sorry. Oh, chop finely. Okay. Wow. That's it for preparations. I apparently I'm a master of macaroni and cheese. Look at that. The next step is to boil the macaroni. You'll need a saucepan and a sieve. Saucepan and sieve. What was that? You'll need a saucepan and a sieve. Okay. Bring some water to a boil in the saucepan. Add some salt and boil the macaroni. Add saucepan, salt, boil macaroni. What was that? Macaroni. Okay. Okay. Bring some water to a boil in the saucepan. Add some salt and boil the macaroni. Boil the macaroni. I got that one right the first time. Right. Right. Alright, I'm bored. Continue. What? Oh, I thought and I couldn't click it. Under two teaspoons of salt for every quart of water you are boiling. Lean the pasta against the edges of the pan. You can reduce to moderate heat with a remove remove. Now put the saucepan over the low. Add next. Once the add stir. Look at that, I'm, I'm my own master chef. Classic. But let's put this to the taste. To the taste or to the test? Or how about the taste test? Let's do it to it in the kitchen. We're off. All right, I'm back with the mac and cheese. And I made this with no help from personal trainer cooking. No shade, but let's see how it is. Let's, let's do a little taste test, shall we? Mmm, the smoke is flaring my nostrils. Mmm, mmm. See, psh, who needs a game to cook? But anyways, I don't want this to become a mukbang. I'd rather this be a straightforward review. The fact of the matter is, I have no respect for personal 
cooking trainer? I forget what the name even is. The thing is, like, developers put this time and energy into making something that does not belong on a video game console. Quite frankly, you know, they, there's apps for recipes, and in this day and age, it's much easier to use. Now, I understand, like, with the DS, they're like, oh, let's capitalize on the brain age thing. But to me, you know, there's a point in which you're pushing it. Like, what was the point of this? It's not a game. You can use the internet. And when all else fails, use the back of the box. I mean, without making this a shameless plug for Annie's Mac and Cheese, which comes out amazing every time unless you just don't follow instructions, cooking is not something you need to buy something to learn how to do. It's the same with, like, these other games on the DS, like Teach Yourself Spanish. Why buy a game for that? Like, it's it's it ends up not being a game. It just ends up being a lecture. And... Quite frankly, I'm not into it. There's a reason I haven't played it, Alex, because you can't play it, and I'm not into it. But with that being said, I had fun doing this little review thingy, my Bob. Thanks to my man Alex for sending something and even challenging me. I, I really respected, you know, the call out. So, you know, I appreciate it. Now, I'm really looking forward to a hot cooking mama review from you, my dude. So, with that being said, I got some mac and cheese to enjoy. <laughs>
available DLC. Now, I don't know that it was all available from day one, but I know that from the first day that Smash Ultimate released, which I know you really can't complain about not having enough content, they had mentioned Joker as a release. So obviously that could be a, an easy patch into the game. There's no reason to announce that on like the within the first week that, you know, there's going to be a paid for character. And it's really when you see that it's almost shysty. So I I agree with you. I don't like the idea of having content available to buy up within the first day. Just include it within the full game. I want my game to be complete when I purchase it otherwise I'm pretty much paying for half a game. I still want an expansion pack for F-Zero GX with more content. If DLC was on the GameCube and Nintendo did that, I'd be all for it. See, F-Zero GX just needs to be DLC in general for every Nintendo system ever. Once that comes on the Switch, I think it's pretty much safe to say that they're going to speed past all the competition, but they'll be light years ahead at that point. I just think the whole idea of DLC has been misused. As for games like Starlink, Skylanders, I'm personally not a fan of the idea of having to buy figures or DLC just to access something in the game. Figures should be figures, not electronic toys, that connect to games in order to unlock stuff. Okay, I'm with you there. I actually, I, I would like that the extension that connects to the game does something more than just unlocks like there's a purpose to re-hook it up there's no reason to hook up a ship to starlink after you've done it once because you've already unlocked the thing i actually think the idea of amiibos and smash brothers is pretty novel that you can take it with you and bring it over to a friend's house to share your data and then like plug it in when you want to play with them i don't know that that's been done to a way that it's actually pretty cool because you might as well just be actually fighting in the game I think the idea would work well with Pokemon, but what do I know? I suppose you could say the same about trading card games as well. I used to collect trading cards back in the day, but I don't anymore because I realize just how exploitative it is since you have to buy your way to getting all the good cards with real money. Oh, I miss trading cards. I still have my Pokemon cards. I got my Yu-Gi-Oh cards. I got my Magic cards. Actually, I don't have my Magic cards. I sold them. People used to say Magic was the best game, but I, you know, I, I always liked Yu-Gi-Oh. I never really played Pokemon, but the cards look cool. It's a collector thing, so I understand. It amazes me how this idea of collecting figures for games is a fad these days. It seems like it should have been a 90s thing. In this era, it just seems silly to me. The wow factor of having collectible figures connect to electronic devices would have been cool in the 90s, but now it's just meh. We have better things now. I would disagree with you on a personal level there. I I think the idea of figures coming back is is awesome because when you go into game stores these days, they're a little bland and the toy sections almost liven them up. And, you know, I really wish that these figures did more, like as you're saying, because then it would be impressive. But with the way it is now, I, I see your point that it is just meh. But with that being said, like the Pokey Walker, right? That was a little accessory that you brought around with you and then uh, did things for you in the game. The Pokey Walker was novel and I don't I don't actually like I lost mine a long time ago and I don't really I, I haven't played Heart Gold in 11 years. But the fact that it did something with your Pokemon in game outside of game was pretty awesome. Uh, I guess the iPhone would be considered your accessory for a lot of games like that nowadays, your Pokemon Go. Um, I don't, I haven't dabbled with it, so I, I just don't know, but as a collectible figure, I think the figures themselves need to be on the equivalent of Pokey Walker. They can't just be these, like this plethora of amiibos that are impossible to collect my, fr uh, not my friend, but uh, a guy that I watch here on YouTube, Arlo, who is pretty you know, popular on YouTube as far as gaming content goes. It's a really good video on why Amiibos are a problem for Nintendo and just in general. So I would recommend that video to those who are looking for more content to watch. But that's a hearty comment, Terry. You left me a lot to talk about. So, hey, kudos to you. The next one comes from Boss and Burf, my man, the legend. And he says, the perfect way to do DLC for me 
is to actually work on it after the game releases. None of this day one DLC nonsense or disc locked content. I also don't believe little things like costumes, weapons, etc. should be DLC. That stuff should just be an unlockable in the main game. DLC should only be for big things like new quests or new maps and or levels. I'm 100% with you there. Again, if the ship that I attached to Starlink did more, I would say that it's a good model. As it is, it's not a good model. I'm, a, I'm with you there. I like the ship. I like the fact that I get to fly around it in it in the game, but there's no reason I couldn't have just had that from the start. Characters should not be DLC in my mind. I feel like characters are, are like an extension of the game, and just by locking them out, you're locking out such a little thing that is really not something you should spend money on. It's almost a cheap tactic by the developers. If you're going to pay for something, I'm totally with you. It has to be a map or a level. Like that's that's actual content there. Let's move on. I don't really embrace DLC culture. I don't hate it, but I do hate the fact that many people will toss money at anything, which encourages slimy things like day one DLC. See, that's what I mean is that there's a digital culture that we live in and that the gamer world thrives on. And... People are pretty reckless with their money when it comes to gaming. You know, I guess maybe it's a collector thing to be frugal and only spend it on games that are physical and will go in your collection and maybe the occasional download. But, you know, we're, we're very money conscious, like it, with the amount that like kids will drop on an on software on an iPad. It's scary, especially like these in-game purchases, all that like free to play like shenanigans. You know, I, I don't think it's a good culture. It's not healthy and it's not sustainable for the gamers themselves because then you end up playing one game and we're already so littered with games in this culture that it's 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 going to be hard for developers to come out with like or people like to develop independent games and even be noticed if, you know, the, all the consumers are putting all their money into one game. So nice point. The last hearty comment here comes from what's on my shelf. Actually, he has a comment that pertains to the previous table topic video, and it was about whether to restart a game after a hiatus. He said, maybe I should keep a journal Shenmue style. Funny thing about that, in the other room, I do have a journal for Fire Emblem. I don't do the journal for every game that I play, but if there's major story content that goes on, I will keep the log because that way it does help me with the narrative. So that's a that's a solid tactic right there, and I do feel that's worth sharing. So props to you. What's on my shelf? Now, Centipede actually came to me and asked for a topic request, and I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to phrase it how I want to phrase it. Because I think the way it is, it's going to be difficult for a lot of people to answer. So he asks, topic request, please, how to get noticed on YouTube? Actually, now that I think about that, I don't think that needs to be phrased, rephrased rather. Part of my concern with that question was that of the demographic that watches me, nobody really watches me that has such a substantial subscriber base. I'm well aware of that. So it's hard for me to say that any of my viewers can really contribute something to say how to make it big on YouTube because I, I don't, I, I can't even speak to that. But the topic itself is interesting and I do have friends here who watch me that are also make YouTube videos and have had some success, some more so than me, some not. So let's make that the topic this week. How do you get noticed on YouTube? Have at it, team. Team T, team majority. Uh. Uh. And that's it for majority four. It's actually eight. Let's put these together. Bam. It's like double the four. What do you stand for? I stand for majority. Now, I feel like in this installment, we got some good stuff done. We accomplished the challenge video that my friend had wanted me to do for the longest time we covered several classic games you know um mario bros one that's that's a classic i always drop the super i forget that but it is on the nes after all 
And we also looked at DLC as a culture and are thinking about YouTube going forward. I guess, you know, one of the things that I would like to close on as an idea is about just staying motivated on YouTube because I continue to do this and I've set up this system for myself where even though I have to export this 3.5 gigabyte file every time from my Mac and it takes like two hours, this works for me. And YouTube can be stressful and um you know one of my one of my best friends here on youtube boston burf um is is taking a break so that 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 kind of hit me when he told me that and it may be a permanent break so um you know for me as a content creator seeing my friends either stop or slow down it, it can be hard to motivate myself but I think it's important to to find a way that it does not become so stressful. And, you know, I, I've I've faced points where it's been very difficult for me to make content. Even coming off of work, I'm just exhausted. And, you know, I I had an issue with, with being able to play more games. And I used to review like every game I ever had that I played. But I definitely think that you have to find the system that works best for you. I'm kind of jumping ahead on next week's table, next month's table topic. But in any case, you know, I appreciate you. I appreciate the majority that supports majority. And as always, I will give you the majority of me. Take it easy, team. Miss you. See you in the next video. Be good.